talk about the social phenomenon you call affective education and how it plays into this whole uh, question of just how good schools are. A great deal of time and energy uh, are spent on things which are non-academic subjects, which are essentially psychological kinds of subjects, uh, exercises. And this is known as affective education, as if you can somehow educate people's feelings rather than to educate their intellect. And the problem is that uh, most public school teachers have no such qualifications, if anyone has such qualifications. But certainly they are not psychiatrists or psychiatrists, psychologists. Uh, they have no idea of the emo emotional turmoil they may be stirring up uh, in the students. And there's some evidence that that's, that's happening in terms of medical reactions, of vomiting, uh, signs of nerves in various uh, ways. Uh, but more than that, what they tend to do is to try to alienate the child from the parent. And I think that's the most dangerous thing they how do. How did they do that? Well, if you read the literature, it's just astonishing how parents are depicted in the literature as people who are hung up, who have old-fashioned ideas. Uh, one of the areas in which they do is a sex education. But it's not sex education as such, because there are a whole series of kinds of education of the uh, emotions, as they would put it. Uh, which do the same thing. And the idea is that the child is supposed to make his own decisions, and he's supposed to pick his own values on which to make those decisions. So the whole history of the human race is sort of thrown out the window, and Johnny is supposed to start and draw upon his entire eight or nine years of uh, experience in the world uh, to decide uh, what his values ought to be. It was interesting in the uh, book you used an example of an exchange that you had with a student uh, and I guess your question to the student was something like, um, well, what did you learn? And the response was something like, I learned that my thoughts and my feelings are valued. Yes. Uh, whereas there was no effort to speak to a fact or something learned, but rather the emphasis oh, placed yes. on feeling oh, I, and, I know, I know and the interpretation. Th that was actually Ben Stein, a reporter in Los Angeles. And he asked this graduating senior who was considered the smartest kid in the class, what, did you, what do you know about the Vietnam War? And he said the Vietnam War was when North and South Korea were fighting, and they drew a line along the 38th parallel and so on. And uh, Ben Stein said, would it bother you to know that that's completely wrong? He said, no. And he said, then what you just said, that uh, it was that his feelings were valued, his, uh, what his thoughts were valued, and that was it. But now, isn't that of some worth? If you do have a child who, for example, has done nothing but learn by rote, aren't you attempting to bring out the fullness of that young person and get that person to reflect and think and meditate? I <laughs> if you think that confusing the Vietnam War with the Korean War is thinking and meditating, well, then of course that, that, that's, that's very nice. The tragedy is that these kids have no conception of thinking. And if we, we're talking about adding something as an extra along the fringes, fine. But when you see how far behind we are behind almost every large industrial nation, or even behind Korea, for heaven's sake, uh, you wonder what makes them think that we have the luxury of spending our time on these kinds of uh, little experiments in the classroom. Uh, just recently I received a letter from a high school student who wanted my opinion on a wide variety of subjects. And this was a classroom assignment. That This questionnaire was to be sent out to people. And I wrote him back that the opinions of old men like me don't matter. What matters is whether young people like you learn to think, get some knowledge, because you're going to be making these decisions long after I'm gone. And to think that people are wasting your time, having you send out these questionnaires to people you don't know, is a sign of just why we're so far behind. Dr. Thomas Sowell of the Hoover Institution, his new book is called Inside American Education, The Decline, The Deception, The Dogmas. Talk about some of the dogmas that you feel are driving American education. Well, one of the dogmas is the notion that you have to feel good about yourself. And I think nothing so epitomized this for me as a study of mathematics t given to 13-year-olds around the world. And uh, um, uh, Koreans came in first, Americans came in last. And one of the questions that we asked these kids was, uh, are you good at math? 23% of the Koreans said yes. Uh, something like 68% of the Americans said yes. And so American kids felt good about themselves, but uh, they didn't know any math. Uh, another study was done of uh, 12th graders in Japan to see if they liked math. 
the 12th graders in Japan disliked math more than the 12th graders in the United States, and probably for good reason, because it was probably hard at math. Uh, but the Japanese don't worry themselves about whether their 12th graders like math. They worry or themselves. feel good about That's themselves. That's right. They don't care. The fact is, when you come out of there, you're going to know a certain amount of stuff. And, uh, and if you don't do that, you, you, you know, your parents are going to be on you. Is there a balance to be achieved that is helping students feel good about themselves and learn at the same time? Or is it either or, Dr. So? Uh, I do not believe that there are free lunches in education or anywhere else. And it's hard work. That, uh, that's right. And I think that's, that's part of it, too. A lot of these programs are really a substitute for hard work by the teachers. I mean, when, when I, I think, think of the teachers I had, they could not have cared less whether I felt good about myself. They didn't ask me, how, how did you get to school? Did you walk these 15 blocks from home? Or did you have money for the trolley? They couldn't have cared less. They wanted to make sure I had better have my homework when I got there, and it had better be right. Are you putting most of the responsibility here on the teachers themselves? What about the parents? The parents have their responsibilities as well. On the whole, the parents, I think, turn out a lot better than the education establishment. The education establishment is very good at blaming everything on parents and seizing upon this example and that example. But the cold fact is that for a period of decades, the parents and the public have been pushing the schools to have more academic material. And the schools have been pushing in non-academic directions. And by and large, the schools have been winning that more and more fancy fads and gimmicks have been coming into the schools. Uh, very often people say, you know, the Catholic schools do so much better with so little money. Uh, and, and I've come to think that really I don't want to take anything from the Catholic schools. But I think the fact that they have less money may be one of the reasons why they're doing so well, because they cannot afford these expensive gimmicks and fads. Dr. Sell, what was your own background? Uh, who was, if anyone, encouraging you as you were growing up? Uh, why did you get turned on to education? Oh, I, I guess my family, that um, I know when I went into the seventh grade, they make a, made a big to-do about it. And I didn't understand it until they told me that no one in the family had gotten to the seventh grade before. And they thought it was marvelous. You had uh, both parents in the home? Uh, for part of the time until my father died. And then I had other, other, other relatives as well. All but of whom but were supportive of oh, you. Oh, yes, and, and, and pushing and whatnot. Now, of course, they, they could not take part in the educational process. They had no way of doing that. And they couldn't come to school and do all the things, you know, that the parents must get involved. It's utter nonsense. Whole generations of uh, both blacks and immigrant uh, kids had decent educations without their parents becoming involved in the school. There are an awful lot of people and teachers uh, among the first and foremost who would say that the challenges facing teachers today are far more difficult and complex than those that faced uh, your teachers when you were growing up. Such as? Uh, such as drugs in the school, such as weapons in the school, such as kids who really don't want to learn, mm -hmm. uh, kids who come totally unprepared to do anything else but make trouble in the classroom. Yes. Yes. I mean, there are those uh, those kinds of phenomena. There, there, have always, there have always been tough kids, and there have always been tough neighborhoods. To the extent that there are today, Dr. Maybe, so. may, may, maybe not, but I think, too, that part of the de degeneration of uh, morals has been helped out by the kind of nonsense they're taught in the schools. Uh, I think there's also this sort of maudlin notion that we have to uh, keep them all together. Uh, back when I was coming along, they had dumping ground classes in schools. And if you didn't want to learn, there were places where you could go and not learn. I remember those well. <laughs> yes, yes. And I remember uh, t uh, uh, t uh, t a time when I was going through various phases, they dumped me. I said, when, when you're ready to learn something, you can come back. You How know? were you dumped? Oh, I was, I was assigned to Chelsea Vocational School in New York. Uh, and uh, it was a total waste of time. In fact, I told the people at Chelsea Vocational School it was a total waste of time. But since, since there are truancy laws, I'll be here, but I'll bring my reading matter, so I won't waste the time totally. Uh, but the fact is that there were standards, and you can't have the position of what can we do for every single child. You know, it's a little like trying to get the drunk driver off the highway. You've got to get him off that highway before he kills somebody. Now, how he deals with his alcoholism and whatnot, that's a separate and Que and secondary question, but you can't have him running up and down the highway clobbering other people. What about school textbooks, Dr. So? What's happened there? The, well, the phrase is dumbing down. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things I did in doing research for this book was to go back and look at the old McGuffey's readers. And I must say, you could not use those books today because people wouldn't know what all those big words the, meant. The, yeah, the vocabulary was really impressive. Oh, whereas a, there was a, a history book that was uh, be, being considered to be used as a textbook in the high school. And they told the author to take out words like spectacle and admired because those were too difficult for the students. And, of course, they used uh, much more... Uh, bigger words than that uh, for in eighth grade textbooks and, and, and generations past. And you're suggesting that the dumbing down of textbooks is part of this entire process oh, absolutely. Of, of, of creating a system that's not really teaching as it should. And the, and the social tragedy of it is especially hard on low-income people. You see, if you're low-income, you're either going to get a good education or you're going to stay in poverty, by and large, with, with rare exceptions. People of my generation in Harlem uh, got a good education. And so, uh, no matter how poor they were, they could always go on. People very often try to be complimentary to me and say, you know how wonderful it is that you came out of this background and went on to get your degrees and all this kind of business. And I try to tell them, you know, that was not that unusual. That uh, uh, half a block away from me, there was a guy who went on to become a psychiatrist, owns land, uh, owned land in Napa Valley, and is now living in retirement overseas while, while I'm out here trying to work for a living. Uh, in the same building that he lived in lived Harry Belafonte. Five blocks the other way was James Baldwin, you see. Uh, three blocks this way was where Colin Powell went to college at CCNY. And these are all people at the same place at the same time. And you notice that none of that all of those pe all those people, although how different they are, uh, they all spoke impeccable English. There was none of this junk that you hear now. This being uh, lionized, this so-called black English, which the kids' parents don't speak. Uh, you know that you got a good education. Now, what you did with it was your business.